The purpose of why we're here today um, is to try to kind of pull all this together. Um, and as uh, we were introduced, I, I am Jim Spalding. I, I run the uh, federal energy uh, side of the business, primarily focused on the energy services performance contracting business. Um, we're getting ready to step into uh, a session which is going to sound like we're speaking a foreign language. And so uh, I'm going to challenge everybody out there that if we use an acronym and we don't identify it first, raise your hand so that uh, we can make sure that we do identify it. Uh, I, I was going to say that we would pay you a dollar, but th that's probably not going to happen. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's my introduction, Mike. I'm Michael Ross. I'm the business development manager for the public sector. Uh, I've been focusing on uh, performance contracting uh, for about a year and a half. Uh, worked uh, very close to Jake Woolley in trying to uh, incorporate data centers into utilizing that contract. And, as you know, he, he, DOE was the first one to put a um, ESPC notification of opportunity out for a data center only ESPC contract. So I spent my focus over the 18 months. And I'm Jay, and I'm Jay Hendricks, uh, head for a data center team in North America, uh, our COC, uh, for building technologies. And uh, DSIM is under my area of responsibility. So I'm talking a little bit about that today. Okay. Just real quick, too, uh, my background is I'm a pilot, and they gave me the flipper, and I like talking with my hands, so if I lose the flipper or something, you'll know why, so let's try this. Okay, so here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, we, we've heard from the IT side, we've heard from the facility side, and that's what we're going to kind of be emphasizing today is how do we integrate uh, the uh, facilities uh, with the IT side of the business, and then in addition to that, can we do that uh, successfully under energy services performance contracted? Uh, Spe specifically with data centers. And then the most important part that we're going to get into is on the measurement and verification portion of it because energy service performance con or savings performance contracts um, are great, <clears throat> but you know, if you're from Missouri, you want people to, to show you. So M&V is super important as far as setting the baseline and being able to, to uh, verify that and show you the, the uh, set, uh, savings. And then we're going to kind of go into the Q&A portion. So if you, if you kind of look at, you know, the IT side of the house, things are kind of changing and evolving. A CIO five, ten years ago was more worried about how many servers were, did I need, what was my networking platform going to look like, how much storage did I need to order. And as you've heard, there's a tipping point going on right now. There's a transformation where you're going from just hardware and providing stuff out to end users. You're now having to transform and look at how you're going to deliver services. And services can come in and how you deliver those in multiple ways. You can look to a cloud and consume it, or you can look at building it yourself, or you can look at managing it in a hybrid type of model. The bottom line is these all are ways of being able to meet the demand, but they all cost a lot of money, as you all know. Okay. <clears throat> I like to call this the... Uh, the uh uh, Ten Commandments of uh, the Facilities versus IT. So, uh, as you can kind of see, in the past there's been some conflict or separation, I should say, between IT and the facilities. Uh, specifically with the facilities, I mean, that, that's a long-term investment. You're looking at 20 plus years. So, when you're going in and, and thinking about doing energy savings, you, you're, you want to make sure that that energy savings is going to pay off as quickly as possible, but then it's going to last for an extended period of time. And you can read kind of the list of the items that are on there. And then from the IT side, Mike? Yeah, you know, this is really interesting is that uh, you know, an IT guy was happy as long as he could plug something in and, and it worked. He didn't have to talk to facilities. It, it wasn't until he plugged something in and it didn't work. Or he plugged something in and he took out a whole bank or something. And, and, and then he's screaming at the facilities guy. You know, we, we have design specs where we're looking at things on a three to five year time bound period. And, you know, you're recycling uh, your devices a lot more than you're recycling, you know, typically on the facility side of the house. So here you are, we're constantly growing on the IT side, and you're kind of static on the facility side. But when you start looking at what you're trying to do with consolidation and saving energy, he can do his thing and be fine. And I continue to grow, and what happens, I erode what he's doing and the gains he's gotten. 
So you have to work together. So that line there is a total vector, the whole total service vector that we have to look at to make sure that we have the sustainability that uh, Jake talked about. Talk about how we are able to grow together and control the environment versus putting a curtain between the two of us and not figuring out what's going on. Yep, and another important point on, on this, this picture right here is you, you guys have heard the significant savings that can be achieved on the data centers through the various methods. Uh, looking at it from a holistic picture, it's so important that I have the data center included with the total project because if the uh, facility has some project that they want to include in the performance contract that has a longer payback period, because of the significant savings that's associated with the data center, it helps pull the payback period down overall for uh, doing the holistic uh, project. So super important that these two become married together. So f before you change the slide, so now you can walk down to your facilities guy and tell him you got money to help him do with his projects. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll work. Okay, uh, ESPC, uh, Energy Savings Performance Contracting. <clears throat> uh, this is a busy slide, so what I, I like to say is I'm going to give you the, the bluff, the bottom line up front. The bottom line up front on a performance contracting, it, well, first off, how many people in here know what a performance contract is? Wow, that's good. That, that, that's good. That's very good. Uh, how many people is this brand spanking new? Uh, not many. So, good. Um, everybody knows that an energy savings performance contract, uh, it, it, it has to do with private industry coming in and using their dollars uh, to take a look at a project to see if it's going to make sense uh, to do certain energy savings measures such that uh, they will be significant enough to pay for the overall cost of the project. It's broken down into three parts. You've got your, your pre-contract period, your performance period, and your post-contract period. The pre-contract period is where we come in, do a cursory look at the facility and see whether or not this is going to make sense. So we'll look at the data center, we'll look at, uh, and I'll just use a, a base, uh, you know, it's going to have 11,000 buildings on it. So we're going to look at the, the overall big picture of what shape is the base in, uh, does it make sense to come in there and do uh, energy savings performance items or uh, ECMs, energy conservation measures on that, and if it does, then we're going to go into the performance period. Performance period is where we're going to sit down with you out there, uh, different agencies, talk about what the ECMs are. Uh, which you can't raise your hand because I did identify that. Um, and talk about what do you want to do, what do you want to achieve, which ones make sense, uh, put together the package, execute it, and then we're going to go into the uh, post-contract period. After we've uh, gotten everything installed and we go into the post-contract period, that's where the measurement and verification comes in. So that's a, a short version of a very complicated slide that has a lot of information on it. And to kind of put it in perspective, uh, this is kind of a flow of how you would go from concept to contract uh, in order to do a uh, energy savings performance contract. So you as an agency would reach out to one of the contacts that's within FIMP or the Army Corps because they have uh, some of the most active uh, federal uh, ESPC uh, vehicles out there. I'm sure you guys have heard of the, the term Super 16. Uh, that's where that term Super 16 comes from is under the DOE and say that, hey, you know, we want to do a data center in conjunction with an energy uh, savings performance contract, um, it can, does it make sense? And FEMP especially is very, very proactive, very helpful at coming out to the agencies and looking at the facilities and saying, yeah, you know, this, this, this actually makes sense. So let's move forward. And so then they'll go into uh, an NOO, which is a notice of opportunity, or if it's with the court, it'll be an RFQ, request for quote, uh, and they're going to reach out to all the ESCOs, which is an energy uh, services company. Um, and the beauty of uh, narrowing it down to 16 is all these companies have been uh, properly vetted based on past performance. So in order to get into the, the ESCO environment, you have to go through a process with uh, DOE and actually prove that you can be a, qual a qualified and competent ESCO in order to do this stuff. Um, and then after that uh, response is done and there's a down select made, uh, then uh, we're going to go into going into the PA phase, which is the uh, preliminary assessment in which we will come in and do 
the not so detailed but more of a 30,000 foot picture, maybe down to a 15,000 foot picture of what can be done uh, at that facility uh, that's going to actually produce some, some savings, determine what the ECMs are, and then um, sit down and work with you out there to see which of the ECMs you want to implement, and then we'll go into the IGA phase, which is the investment grade audit. The investment grade audit is going from the 15,000 foot uh, level down to the one inch level. Um, it's basically coming in and doing a very, very detailed assessment for several reasons. Number one, to make sure that what we said will work will work. And number two, I keep talking about measurement and verification. We need to have that baseline, and the only way we can get that baseline is to come in and do that IGA. Um, after that, uh, implementation uh, period comes into play. Then we go into the performance measurement and verification. And you're, you're going to keep hearing me harp about measurement and verification, but I'm a firm believer in that if I say, you know, it's going to save, I have to give you a guaranteed savings. That's why an ESPC works so well. So I have to have a baseline and I have to be able to show you. So to me, one of the most important portions of an ESPC is the measurement and verification. And Mike, you want to add something? Yeah, just a couple of things I wanted to add. Typically, when you go through this process, you're, you're dealing on the facility side of the house. They kind of understand this, this methodology and this process. But for those of you in the audience that are IT focused and you wanted to drive this, and I come to you and I stand in front of you, I said, look, I've got a way for you to get your consolidation done, your virtualization done, and all the things that you have unfunded mandates for. And I say, it's not going to cost you any money. You'll look at me like a dog who's heard a sound for the first time. You'll just cock your head and go, what? And then you'll go, then you'll go into your, your, your contracting shop, and your contracting you know, officer will go, there's no way this will work. FIMP has, as, as Jake alluded to earlier, this entire curriculum, but also FIMP has an agency-by-agency desk for your contracting folks to call and walk through the NOO, we, we did define that, right? Okay. The N NOO and, and, and all the other steps associated with getting it out because the NOO is the first time you will go out to the public and say, this is what I want. And by the way, an NOO, we're, we're talking millions of dollars worth of projects here. An NOO is typically three or four pages. And the response back is typically in a neighborhood of 10 to 15. And it just boggles my mind that we're able to do something like this with very little paper. Now, a statement of work is huge. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but it, it, it gives you the ability to get something done out quick and start looking at what you need to do. So I'll, as Jake talked about this earlier, please utilize FIM. Yep. Right. Yeah, and just uh, last thing, and we'll move on. Uh, one of the reasons that the responses, which a typical DOE response is going to be about 20 pages, one of the reasons it is kept to that, that short uh, amount of information is because DOE has done their homework with private industry. Right. We had to go through an extreme qualification process to get certified, and we had to compete to become part of the Super 16. So um, it, it, it does work. Great. My flipper's slow. Okay, uh, this is a, a kind of a, a holistic picture of the overall process as far as, you know, why is Siemens and HP kind of joined together, you know, we're sitting up here on the stage and, and you know, that's good and all, but, you know, why? And, and the reason is, is, is so we can be successful in helping you all be successful in meeting your various mandates. And so this is kind of a picture uh, looking from the bottom up as far as from the agency program coordinator, agency stakeholder drive requirements. And then this is where the Siemens HP relationship comes in. We are very, very good at doing performance contracting on a facility level. So we're good with the utilities, good with the distribution, central plant operations, alternative energy sources. That's kind of my area of expertise. I love the alternative energies. Some of them make sense, some of them don't. Um, and, and that's what we'll also define when we come in and take a look at, at the overall uh, holistic picture for the ESPC. And then the building and performance and sustainability. Uh, one of the other things under building performance and sustainability that is so important uh, that can be included in an ESPC that a lot of people forget about is the service side of that. So the service side is when we, when we come in and do an ESPC, we're not just going to come in, you know, install the widgets and then walk away and say, look, it works great. We'll see you in a year and tell you it works again. We're going to be there doing the service the entire time. 
And then on the HP side, Mike. Yes, yeah, on the HP side of the house, uh, you know, getting back to what Jim was talking about, where he's strong, I'm weak, and where he's weak, I'm strong. And together we have the ability to deliver, you know, a holistic package to you. So you heard all the facilities things that he talked about. Now the IT folks are interested in virtualization and cloud and you know infrastructure in the data center and, and being able to measure and verify that across their little slice. But if you look at the wrappers around this entire slide, you'll see things like program, you'll see things like conservation measures, but the most important thing is at the top there. We want to be able to measure and verify across this entire enterprise to include the facilities. You know, we want to be able to show the performance as we talked about earlier when Mike was up, he was talking about you only know what you know. You've got to be able to understand that baseline and being able to grow and measure and verify that you had that performance. And then we, he's talked about the contract negotiations associated with all this. But this is how you, you, took at, you look at this thing holistically. You can't do it in a, in a separate silo environment. Yep. One of the last things, and, and, and we'll go to the next slide, um, is when we come in and are looking at an energy services perform or savings performance contract, I'm going to tell you everything. I'm going to tell you every single savings that can be uh, saved out there through energy conservation or whatever the case may be. So uh, uh, what, what I'm trying to say is don't get sticker shock. Uh, a lot of times we'll come in with this, this huge list of these ECMs that says, you know, we're, we can do all these savings here, 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 and here. Here's the simple payback. Here's your average payback for the entire program. And you were thinking it might be a five or $10 million job. It may be a $50 million job. It just depends on what we find uh, because until we get in there and start digging, uh, you may not actually know what all is out there that you can be able to you know, uh, achieve a significant savings on. So don't get sticker shock when we come in and start saying, hey, here's all the stuff that we can save. Uh, the project grows. That's a good thing because remember, we're paying uh, for the cost of it up front and you're recouping uh, the savings off of it for the long term. So um, work with this. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> this is uh, a pretty picture. Um, but basically, w what I'd like you to get out of this is it's just a picture of the performance contracting basics as far as think of the, the blue portion. That's all the dollars that you're paying out there, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, the uh, utility cost. That's all your costs associated with the energy going into data center, into the facility, et cetera. We're going to come in there and we're going to do what's in the red. That's going to be the guaranteed savings. We're going to work with all the different various methods, do all the different studies, see all the different savings that can be made, and we're going to give you a guaranteed savings amount uh, that uh, will also cut your overall utility cost down, which is a little thin line of yellow up at the top. So you're going to initially be saving money uh, right up front. And then we get paid back over that period of time for the capital improvement costs associated with improving the, either the data center consolidation or the facilities. And then at the end of the term, uh, you guys uh, get 100% of the savings. Um, just FYI, you know, one of the questions I commonly hear is, well, what's the typical payback period? It, it, it varies, but typically we like to try to keep it to less than 20 years, um, or I could give you the lawyer's uh, response, which it, it depends. Um, but the bottom line is it depends on, on uh, what the, the project really is. If it's just a data center, the payback period could be three years, could be seven years. Uh, if it's a data center and you want to do other stuff associated with infrastructure of the facilities, it may be a 15-year payback. Right now we're seeing kind of on average just as a, a rule of thumb about a 15-year payback. Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything on no, that. No, I think we're going to talk about PUE later on. So. Um, and then uh, the last thing on there, if you look in the parentheses there, uh, you know, what's associated with that guaranteed savings, the one thing I like to emphasize is the service portion of it. Um, again, you know, we're going to do the install, and, it, and, it, and people go, well, gosh, why do you want to do the service side of it? Well, think, at it, think of it from, from private industry's perspective. It's our vested interest to make sure this stuff works because if we don't make sure, uh, if, if, if it doesn't work and we have to call somebody else in, we're going to have, number one, an unhappy customer, and number two, something's going to have to be done So, um, to make sure that the guaranteed savings moves on. Otherwise, we don't get paid. So, All right. <clears throat> this is, again, a bunch of words, and I'm not going to read the words, but uh, what is it? Uh, Federal ESPC guideline, here's the bluff. The bottom line up front is 
anybody can do an ESPC, okay? Uh, any agency has access to doing an ESPC. Uh, you do have the ability to finance a project out up to 25 years. Doesn't really happen unless it's a very, very complex project or a very large project. Um, and again, the ESCO's financing 100% of the capital cost. So um, don't think that, well, gosh, you know, I, you know, because I'm in DOI or whatever that I can't use, or the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I can't use the, D, uh, the DOE vehicle. Not true. I I anybody has access to using uh, the DOE vehicle. So. And I don't know how many of you are out there on the state or local side. We have things ca called performance contracts you know, out in the states. Uh, some states have passed legislation to allow you to participate in such a vehicle. Uh, it works the same way, same type of criteria. It's just not called an ESPC, it's just called a performance contract. Okay, <clears throat> the big M and V slide. Uh, the thing about measurement and verification, how are savings verified? There's multiple different methods of doing it and you can see on there there's option A, B, there's option D, there's option C, you know, analyzing utility bills. Uh, measured factors under A, uh, A and B and D. Here's the bottom line on measurement and verifications. There are defined methods of different levels of measurement and verification, but when we put together an uh, energy savings performance contract, uh, it's going to be a combination of all the above on the facility side. And uh, as Mike will tell you here in a second, uh, there's some significant things associated with it on the IT side that gets pulled in as well. So Mike? Yeah, so at the bottom here, you'll see something. When you have IT devices, various ages, um, uh, in locations that are of various ages, and you have to have some ability to understand what your baselines are. What is my energy consumption on the, those, those, those devices that are out there? So we have historical data within HP intellectual property, or you can use historical data that you guys have. But the bottom line is, we are going to look at exactly what, by device, very detailed data on how much power is going to be consumed by every device, from where you are today to where you're going to go. We're going to measure it and verify it. And Jay will talk about DSIM later on. Did we, did we, did we, did we, okay, DSIM, I'm fine. Okay. DSIM later on where we can model so that the, the thing that I, ha I find very interesting is that we have all these IT folks out here and we talked about facility cycle and I've talked about my chain cycle, three to five years and every five years I'm, I'm putting in a new server. How does the ESPC contract allow you to refresh if it goes 25 years? Am I gonna lock you in for 25 years to one platform? No. So you see that we have the ability to do the modeling mm -hmm. and we know exactly where you're gonna go. We know what we have to meet from an energy savings target and we have to verify it. So DSIM gives us a capability of looking at the overall model. And we've talked about these energy conservation modules. Those are like train loads of projects that we deliver energy savings. We factor in an ECM in five years for servers or networking or storage. Whatever your refresh cycle is, we factor that in and we can use the DCM capabilities to do that modeling on this. Yeah, so, so as Mike said, that's put into the costing model for uh, the, the ESPC. So very important, you know, you're not gonna you know, do a 25 year contract and, 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 and at the end of the 25 year contract end up with the same equipment that you originally started with. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. Okay, ESPC is for IT. Uh, it, th this is truly kind of a, a, a unique slide. I actually like this slide because it kind of walks us through the various steps associated with what's involved with an ESPC. Number one is education, and, and I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, if you don't know what you don't know, you know, that's where you need to interact with industry to find out what exactly is associated with doing an ESPC both from the facility perspective and from the uh, uh, data uh, center side of the equation. So, uh, you know, knowledge is power and, you know, work with industry. Industry will gladly reach out and, and, and help folks that want to understand how an ESPC might work for their situation. 
Um, and again, there's no money associated with, with uh, doing an ESPC, so it, it, it's nothing at risk there. Um, and then bridging the gap between IT and facilities, we've got to get away from this mentality of us versus them. You know, hey, I just plug it in and, and the data center works and I don't care how much power it takes. Those days are over. I mean, uh, it, it, you want to try to be integrated with the facility side of the equation. And then controlling scope. I'd mentioned earlier that we're going to come in and we're going to identify everything. So, you know, the, the ECMs that we identify may be four or five pages long and may be ten pages long. Doesn't mean you have to do everything, but we would not be doing our job if we did not identify all the savings that could be uh, obtained out of uh, working at whatever the facility is to help you meet your goal. So it's going to be up to you and working with us or whoever the ESCO is to control that scope. And then measurement and verification tools. I keep saying that over and over, but again, you got to know what your initial baseline was so that we can show the guaranteed savings over that period of time. And then this number five, I, I love whoever came up with this word, this hyperdynamic ESPC. A hyperdynamic ESPC, what the heck is that? Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> I didn't think so. Okay, it, a, a hyperdynamic ESPC is nothing more than, than a, uh, I'll call it a um, composite contract or composite ESPC. Uh, it could be an example where we're doing energy savings performance contracting and then we find out that if we put in like a 15 megawatt solar array, uh, it will further in, in, in enhance your, your cost savings, but we may need to do that as a PPA or a power purchase agreement. So we may fold a power purchase agreement in with an ESPC to make sure that you get the maximum benefit. So it's nothing more than being a little bit flexible on what all gets built into that energy savings performance contract. Mike, you want to add anything? Yeah, just, just one thing I'd like to add is, and, and we've talked about it briefly, but you got to know who your stakeholders are. You know, we've talked about service catalogs. We've talked about, you know, identifying exactly what the mission is, identifying those applications that roll up to it. If you don't know who your stakeholders are and you're going to design this thing and you may leave somebody behind, it may have a big impact on you. So it's very important for you to work with us so we can work with you to help you identify everyone that needs to come to the table to participate in this. And that's so, so important. I was just finding it funny that we're on page 53. I didn't know I had 53 slides. Yes, yeah, I, I saw that earlier. <laughs> they rolled them all, all right, now, th this is where I'm not an IT guy, Mike. <laughs> so, so <laughs> when you start looking at how to identify energy conservation modules in an IT enterprise, you know, in the facilities world, we can figure out what the HVAC, the insulation impact, you know, UV uh, uh, windows and, and, and effects on heat. We, we can do those things. How do you identify ECMs in this world is very interesting. So we have a kind of an envelope of I'm running, I'm operating, I'm spending money, and, and now I'm going to try to figure out how to, to save things. You have to be transformational. You know, if you start looking at the, the, the lower end of this, this line, you, you can close closets off and you can kind of consolidate onto a floor space, logical and physical, but you're not really going to get much return on your investment in doing that. You're just basically moving it to another location. Where you get transformational is in the blue area. You start looking at how I handle virtualization. You know, virtualization is I've got servers that are running out there 10, 15 percent very in energy inefficient. They're just sitting there idling most of the time. How can I aggregate those together so I can increase my utilization and then spread the workload across all those servers is what virtualization buys you. So now I become more energy efficient. And then when you start looking at, well, when do I need these applications? Do I need them every day? No. What's the seasonality associated with these? Applying automation after you virtualize gives you another savings function. But then you start looking at the converged management of all that. And now I have the ability to, to throttle up and throttle down. But I think the most important thing is to understand what uh, most of the speakers has talk, have talked about is this private cloud versus a hybrid cloud. Where do I really start offloading things that I really don't need, that are, that are commodity basis? And where are my mission critical things that I need to do? And when you understand that, you now have the total picture of where your ECMs can come from. The hardest thing and the most cost that we end up spending is on application remediation. Because when you start looking at 
an application that's been running around, and when it was written, it was written by a guy who came out of college and 1965, and it was on CICS, and it ran on an IBM mainframe, and it had a 3705 front end processor, and, and all of a sudden, you know, where did that come from? And how do I remediate that? And is that something I can sunset or not? So these are the difficult things that we know that you're facing, but we help you identify the savings so that we can give you a holistic approach to being able to get this transformational environment on an enterprise basis. So, we've talked about power usage effectiveness uh, a couple of times here, and, and, and I'm going to go through this. You know, this is coming from the green grid bench, benchmark. It's basically, you know, you have different people with different P, PUEs, and you want to try to get down to a target 1.7. That's, this is what this thing is saying. Uh, and this is a typical data center. Your mileage is going to vary depending on virtualization and how old the data center is and how many applications you're running. But uh, they kind of say, this is what your return on investment and your payback period might be based on these small parameters, okay? So if you have a, a PUE uh, of, of one, it's the best. PUE of two is saying that for every one unit of energy, it takes two to cool. So a PUE of four says for every one, it takes four to cool. Very energy inefficient and therefore you will see the, the cost associated with getting to a PUE of 1.7 is represented there. But let me give you some live data. Without mentioning the agency, uh, they were spending uh, $710,000 a year in power. They had a 22,000 square foot data center. Uh, they, their virtualization was in the neighborhood of about 15 to 20%. They had a, a, a little over 300 servers of various ages. Uh, we did the modeling and we came up with reducing it down to 15,000 square feet on the data center. We reduced the footprint about 80% on the servers through virtualization. And we were able to spin off some things into a private cloud that were, could be a commodity. So we took them from $710,000 a year. And PUE, by the way, I think was a little over three. We took them from $710,000 a year to 17,510. So Jake talked about the savings associated with that. You start looking at straight line math, there's a lot of money that can be saved. And those savings are returned to you once the contract's paid off. Yeah, and what it also does that is of huge significance for the value of the energy savings performance contract or the ESPC is it pulls the simple payback period down. I mean, you see a payback period of 1.7 years, and you, you have another item that you wanted to put in and, and just say it's whatever, solar canopy, carports, or whatever, uh, that has maybe a 40-year a payback. By averaging those two get, uh, together, it pulls your simple payback uh, period back for the performance contract to a very, very reasonable level. So, so, so again, go back to your facilities guys, say, I've got some money for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, considerations for me measurement and verification. Um, again, I keep talking about the M and V portion of this and, and how do we get the baseline. And uh, Mike, if you want to go over the, uh, the uh, establishing an accurate uh, asset inventory for the data side of it. So how many of you guys have asset management tools installed? Well, it's consistent. That's consistent. <laughs> the, the thing about, about these tools, they're not very accurate. I mean, you'd be lucky to get 80% of, of your total inventory collected. So you end up having to try to figure out what's missing. So you have to end up talking to people to figure this all out. But this is where you have to talk to your stakeholders to find out what's going on. You, you, you may have a, a server in a closet and as Bernie talked about earlier, the counts went up because they changed the definition of a data center because it's a server with storage and networking device in a closet. Is it centralized or decentralized? Do I have access to it or don't I? Is it part of the overall aggregation process that I have to go through? So you have to be careful about how you're going to establish this baseline because the baseline is so important to show you exactly how we save on your power consumption down the road. It's, if, you, if you don't do it up front and do it right, 
you know, as, as Mike McFerrin talked about, you got to define your project. You got to define where you're going. And if you, you can't figure out where you are, you'll never know that you got there. So making sure you establish good, accurate inventory is so important in the ESPC. Yeah, but, and that's kind of where the, the DSIM, the, the data center infrastructure management comes into play. And, and that's kind of what those two uh, pictures right there are kind of uh, trying to portray a little bit. Um, and having said data center infrastructure management, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jay to kind of go through uh, some DSIM. Jay? Thanks, guys. So have we, uh, have we mentioned measurement and verification enough today already? <laughs> have, we, have we, you know, said how important it is for us to be able to measure and verify? Um, and it's clear to me that, or clear to us, that we're going to have to have a tool in order to do such a thing. All right. You're going to need a tool to establish a baseline, and then you're, you're going to be able to, after the fact, compare your after the fact to your baseline. You're going to need a tool to do asset management so you can track your assets and manage them appropriately. You're going to need a tool to uh, keep track of key metrics and key performance indicators as well. So it will be important to utilize a data center infrastructure management tool, or a DCIM, in order to adequately manage data center performance. Whether you're modeling your white space through a 3D model, and 4D means you put real-time data on top of it so you can get a full, uh, great picture of your data center or your white space, it's much more easier for us as operators to look at pictures and, and data on top of that in a 3D format. We can understand that much more easily than with tabular data, for example. And then there's a real-time monitoring piece because a DSIM, what it, it's, a, it's a big collector. It collects information from all of the systems and then provides you that key information that you're going to put in a high-level dashboard that managers want to see. And then uh, the ability to optimize your data center as you go forward, whether it's uh, with CFD modeling, and the nice thing about a DSIM solution, if it has integrated asset management, as your assets change, you can rerun that model and you don't need to start from scratch. So it's going to be very important that you have a, a DSIM solution going forward. We already got a definition from Gartner. Uh, Jay went through this this morning. And prior to today, how many of you had heard of DSIM before? Can I see a show of hands? So quite a few of you, that's, that's good. So DSIM are software tools, monitor, measure, manage, control data center performance, utilization, and energy consumption. So the key things here are it's about the IT related assets and the infrastructure side. So it's a marriage between the, the infrastructure, the facility sides, and the IT side. It's a bridge. And it provides you a holistic view from the data center perspective. So you can look at the whole entire operation of the data center from a high level point of view. And DSIM tools integrate all facets of system management with building management and energy management. So the important thing too about DSIM, and I mentioned this already, and Mike talked a little bit about it, is about uh, data center asset lifecycle management. It's about from concept to planning to as built to as upgraded that you keep track of your assets and manage them appropriately. One thing, the D, another thing the DSIM does for you is it provides you that semantic relationship or that logical relationship between the IT assets and the, and the facility side of the infrastructure assets. So you can understand the effect of if I lose this particular piece of power equipment, what's that going to affect on my server side? Or, all right, or if I want to add a new server, a decommissioner server, what's the impact of that on my cooling load or on my power chain? The other thing is about collaboration management and, and the people side of this, establishing the right processes, uh, standard procedures and workflow for work orders and such. Whether you follow ITIL practices or you have your own set of practices, you're able to implement and, and institute these practices within uh, your management system, the ones that work for you, per se. Security management, planning and scheduling, and enterprise systems integration, whether I'm going to interface to an ERP system like an SAP and pull cost data out or cost center, where, where are these servers and who owns them and who is tied to them, or if I want to tr uh, tie into a ticketing system, that's the other thing that the DSIM is going to do for you and provide you that integration. Mike, anything to say to that? Yeah, you know, here's a prime example of, you know, facilities folks, you know, making an IT guy happy. And what I like about this is that I have the modeling tools now to figure out if I make these changes, 
what's your overall impact? And I talked about being able to do the refreshes. Here I have the capability of verifying that and when I do the refresh, I'm going to meet the targets that I have for power savings. The other thing that we, we tend to forget is what if I was to move the entire data center someplace where I can use ambient air to cool it? What would be the overall impact on, on that enterprise? Or can I move these sets of applications off someplace else? What's my overall impact? And this decent gives you that capability to do that type of what if modeling, which can be very important for you when you look at your return on investment and figuring out where you want to push and pull, your puts and takes in a certain enterprise and where you want to you know, offload it or put it in another region. So the solution I'm here to tell you about today, Data Center Clarity LC, LC for Lifecycle, uh, it's about making uh, smarter decisions, providing the key information from high-level dashboards or 3D model of the, of the white space or with real-time data on top of it, or being able to optimize uh, your, your solution using a CFD type tool with integrated asset management. And uh, I would encourage you to, if you haven't already, is to stop by the kiosk out here and uh, have our product manager, UMA, give you a demo of the DSIM solution and show you what it's all about. And, it's, and data center clarity is really, it's based on a, a proven set of technologies. <clears throat> and that proven set of technologies is provided by our sister company, Siemens Product Lifecycle Management Software Group. We leverage the capabilities of Team Center and NX for the solution. Team Center and NX have over 7, 000, 7 million licensed viewers out there, right? users. And it's used by industries such as aerospace for GE, Boeing, or uh, on the automotive space by Ford or GM or uh, BMW, or you know, even on the industrial side by Caterpillar and John Deere, for example. But the coolest thing, I think, is that it's actually used by uh, NASA's JPL laboratory, and it was used in the design and simulation of the Mars rover. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Mars rover, actually? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that is really cool. I mean, um, and it really describes you know, what, why, the, why this tool is so powerful and how they used it for the simulation and, and, the, um, and the design of the Mars rover prior to even you know, putting it up in space. And it talks about the seven uh, minutes of terror that, they, that the engineers described when the rover came into the atmosphere at 13,000 miles per hour and, in, and, in, and stopped on the, on the surface of Mars, you know, down to zero, uh, and how they had to simulate that ahead of time. And by the way, their delay in communication was 14 minutes. So they didn't know what happened. It could have crashed and they would have never known it until after the fact. So this software is powerful and it enabled them to do that simulation, you know, prior to putting that before they even cut a piece of sheet metal. So, Mike? Uh, well, it's just briefly, I mean, this is a collaborative process. This is taking what you know, Siemens does well and what we do well. And, and basically, it was all run from a, a data center that uh, we consolidated. Yeah, and I'd just like to clarify one thing. It was going to come to a stop one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just came to a stop the right way, so. <laughs> All right, so th this is our last slide, so no death by PowerPoint. We'll get into some questions here, but just as a quick summary, um, again, ESPCs, uh, they're a practical solution to get to where you want to be with the data centers uh, as far as including all the facilities and hopefully the data center in with that as well. It's a very timely way to, uh, to go from concept to contract as far as to try to achieve your goals. Uh, what's so important about that is when ESPCs first came out, you know, everybody was, I, I won't say naysayers, but the, from concept to actually getting into doing the installs, it, it was, you know, 36 month period, you know, about three years. That's over. It's been done. Uh, we've gotten very good at what we do. DOE's gotten very good at what they do. We're down to about a 12 to 14 month window from concept to contract. So uh, very good on that one. And uh, data centers, again, they are one of the, the largest energy hogs, as, as Mike described, you know, with the $700,000 example there. So, um, you know, seriously consider maybe utilizing the ESPC to help with uh, meeting your, uh, your needs there. Mike? Yeah, I just can't get off the stage without saying fiduciary. Fiduciary. <laughs> 
You don't have, you didn't have a trademark on it yet. <laughs> um, the, the preliminary assessment phase, I wish uh, Jake Woolley was still here, um, because uh, if there's anybody who can attest to this, is that when you make a vendor stand up and say you're responsible and, and to measure and verify and return guaranteed savings, he's going to document the heck out of everything. Trust me. And one of the things that, you know, ended up is that they found things they didn't know they had and they had more documentation associated with their enterprise that it would meet the federal data center consolidation initiative requirements and also to be able to look at the portfolio stat and address all those things. So now, long before you can get started, you've got information you never had before that will give you the ability to move forward very easily. The other thing is that the, I call this a Trojan horse, is that for all you guys out there that ever had a dream of having the IT data center of your life, this is a way you can get this done as long as you can meet the energy standards and the savings, because now it allows you to enhance what you kind of take a piecemeal at doing when the appropriations or the funding comes in. And now you have the ability to say, how much energy can I save? And one thing that I find very interesting is that for the folks out that are in DOD that are out here, you are probably on, can be on multiple tenant locations and bases. You may have an Army and Air Force and a Navy tenant on site. And when you try to you know, say, okay, let's consolidate. Well, how much money do you have? How much money do you have? That's out of the equation now is how much energy savings do you have to be able to say, let's go all in one place and do that. It takes the money emotion, emotions out of it all. The discussion goes away. And then finally, it allows you to look at your stakeholders. And you can tie the mission to the financial side. And it can be justified very easily. Okay? And then finally, the data center center infrastructure management tool is that tool that provides you that measurement and verification and it gives you that holistic view of the entire data center and uh, analyze the total cost of ownership for your uh, your data center at that point. So having said that, I, I think that kind of wraps it up for us and so Lenny, if you want to come up and uh, kick us off stage. No, I'm going to stay on stage for a second. Let's give these guys a hand and leave them up there for a second. Because we have a little time, and I think I have a mic runner, so I just want to open up the floor and see if anybody has any, again, brief, clear, actual questions for the gentlemen who are up here to add, answer briefly and clearly with an answer. Anybody got anything on their minds that they would like to ask about? Because if you don't, I do. I'm going to shoot mine out first to you guys. So um, you're giving me some really good news on one level. On the other level, you are scaring me a little bit. And here's what you're scaring me with a little bit. When I saw that chart about um, how the ESPCs work, I saw like one jump of savings, right? And then I'm paying off that the whole time. Um, it, does, it seems to say I've got to bite off the whole thing at once or I can't move. Can you give me some sense of what if I'm a little bit either chicken or one might say prudent, just depending on how one wants to spin it, can I approach this incrementally at all? Yes. So. Yeah. And great question, Lanny. And, and the answer is yes. Uh, remember, you, you're the customer. You're driving the whole ESPC. Uh, what we've done in the past where, you know, like Lenny referred to, you do see that sticker shock of me trying to bite off the whole thing at one time. We can go in and we can do a phased approach where, you know, if you have hot items that you want to get done right now up front very quickly that's going to give you a lot of savings, we can go in and do that. But because we've identified all of them, if you want to come back later uh, within a two-year period and continue to do some more ECM development under that ESPC, you can do it that way as well. Yeah. Good. That's, I think it's just useful to know there may be some low-hanging fruit or there may be some stakeholders I can't get on board. So personally, I yep. like to do things incrementally. Yep. And again, that's all about the interaction between uh, private industry and the end user, the customer, because there's got to be an interaction there because you don't want to use all your low-hanging fruit because you may need some of that low-hanging fruit uh, in phase one to pay for some stuff you want to do in phase two. Yep. And that's where we'll sit down and collaborate. Great. Anyone else in the room? We have one over here. Let's take you, sir. <clears throat> and again, let us know who you are and who your favorite football team is. 
Uh, Chris Fennig, uh, Navy. Go Packers, beat Vikings always. <laughs> Good. Your question. Um, so does the enabling legislation in the ESPC concept allow uh, the design and development and building of a data center, energy data center from the get-go with the idea in mind that you're replacing five, six, seven no obsolete uh, facilities or something like that? Uh, I, I would like to say yes, but the answer is no. Yeah. It does not. Uh, <laughs> vertical construction, uh, new con vertical new construction associated with an energy savings performance contract is not allowed under the current rule. So uh, it has to be with an existing facility. Even if you can make the justification that, hey, if I tore down those five buildings and it would save X, Y, Z dollars, um, if I built a new one, the way the rules are written right now, and that may change, but the way the rules are written right now cannot be done. However, <laughs> however, go Mike, go. <laughs> there is a, a, a way of working around that. So we they talked about. Uh, is anybody from OMB in the room? Before <laughs> <you>? <laughs> How? <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> so so uh, there are containerized data centers with umbilical cords plugged into existing data centers, it works around that no criteria. And the thing about, we call them performance optimized data centers or pods, uh, it's like a USP jump drive. Basically have, you can stack those things outside in a parking lot and basically plug them in from a management perspective to an existing data center. That's supported and gives you incremental, incremental growth that you need when you need it. So therefore, it's a way of doing it. In fact, uh, a, a little advertising here. HP went from 238 data centers down to, I think, six. I, and the numbers may be a little off, but the problem we're doing now, we're never, we will never, ever build another data center. We will use Echo Pods to be able to do them from now on. It just, it doesn't make sense. The highly dense capacity, PU capabilities, management, it just doesn't make sense to do brick and mortar anymore. You can't re get the return on investment. Great. Anyone else? Here, we. Uh, anybody else we got around other than you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to let that one go. That's how it is in the world of Lenny Lehman Monterey. But with that, if there's nothing else, I'm going to thank these guys. Oh, we got one over here. That's great. Uh, Alfred Toussaint, Nova Technology Partners. A uh, question for you guys. Um, two days ago, uh, the president uh, gave a long speech on uh, climate change um, mm -hmm. yep. with, you know, plans for the government as well. How do you see that focus on the government in terms of uh, a greater mm -hmm. interest within um, uh, government um, uh, establishments to more aggressively go after savings for, mm -hmm. um, you know, for energy? So, uh, great, great question. Yeah, great question. Uh, and we're already doing it um, on our performance contract. You know, uh, the president mentions about carbon output and, and you know, uh, the footprints and all that type of stuff. When we do our detailed investment grade audits, we're looking at all of that. So, I mean, we're talking carbon credits. We're, you know, we're going to say how much carbon's being put out there. Uh, we're looking at the energy. Uh, if you do a reduced energy, not only does it save uh, money for the facility right there, but think about whoever's producing that power. If it's coal generation, it's cutting back on the coal generation for the power as well. So we're already looking at all of that, um, and especially when you get into the commercial side of the business, um, you can start trading wrecks and all sorts of stuff associated with that, and we do help identify all that.